Hi, I'm Pierre Avset, and I will talk to you today about rock physics and seismic reserve prediction, constrained by depositional and burial trends. I start with this slide, it's a teaser. In the upper left corner you can see some seismic data. It's a seismic reflectivity map from a North Sea turbidite field. You see some bright yellow colors and you see some blue colors. And uh, this is actually the yellow image uh, is highlighting a submarine fan system uh, where several wells have been drilled and they have discovered oil in this field as well. Uh, to the right you see a turbidite outcrop. This picture is from the Pyrenees in Spain. It's um, sandstone, sandstone outcrops representing turbidites. Same geology as you find in the, the turbidite field to the left in the seismic in the North Sea. Uh, during conventional qualitative interpretation in the oil industry, uh, interpreters normally try to highlight or find detect geometries and shapes from the seismic. What I want to stress today is how we can use the rock physics to, to build a bridge between the geophysics and the geology into what we call a more quantitative interpretation and show how we can actually bridge that gap uh, using rock physics, rock physics models. And we're going to uh, use rock physics in combination with geological processes to better understand the seismic amplitudes and the strength of the amplitudes you see in the figure in the upper left corner. So we can call this quantitative interpretation. The outline of my talk today, first I'll just give a brief background, motivation from a rock physics point of view. And then I'm going to demonstrate two case examples, one from the Alfheim field in the North Sea, where we use depth trends to improve lithology and fluid classification from AVO. The second example is from the Troll East field in the North Sea. Here also we're going to show how important it is to take into account the burial history and associated variation in rock stiffnesses when we do interpretation of 4D time shifts. The title of this slide is to understand what's inside the container we need to know the container and this is actually quite essential to, to the talk today. Because normally in oil industry we try to look for what's inside the container, whether it's brine, water, or oil, or gas. But the seismic response of hydrocarbons is equally important. It's equally important to know the, the properties of the container. So if it's a stiff sand or a soft sand. So that can be illustrated by this figure. You have a balloon to the left filled with gas and you have a bottle with coke to the right. And really what the seismic wave does, it's a compressional wave that feels the rock. And if you have a soft rock, it's very easy to say what's inside the rock. Whether it's air or fluids and what type of fluid it is. So if you press a balloon, you can easily tell if it's water or air inside it. But if you had the coke bottle and you didn't have the light on and try to compress it, because it's so stiff, you would not be able to tell from the compression itself, whether it's air or fluid inside it. And that's exactly what the seismic wave does. It measures the compressibility of, of, of your rocks, subsurface rocks. And without going into details of the equations, we can actually quantify this from rock physics principles. That means that it's very essential to know the stiffness of the rock and the pore space. So by linking rock physics to geology, we can actually better quantify the stiffness of the, of the, of the rock itself. Then we can also better uh, predict what's inside the rock from a fluid point of view. This slide is a uh, figure. It shows, the upper plot shows a seismic section from offshore Brazil. It's a 2D seismic dip section going from the left it's, it's uh, by close to Rio de Janeiro, so you could imagine it's Copacabana Beach in the upper left corner and you have the very deep water to the right. And you see there are some wells drilled on the shelf, but in this example there, is, there are no wells in the deeper water. 
And this illustrates how, illustrate how we can combine rock physics and geological trends. A very simple geological sketch is shown uh, at the base, and it shows uh, it shows how uh, if we have a lot of well information on the shelf, the question is how how do we know the seismic properties and how the rocks behave in the deeper part of the basin. There will be some depositional trends here, so you could think that your reservoir will be different if they are on the shelf than if they are in the deep water. And geologists have modeled for how these things changes. We also know that there will be diagenetic trends. The rock will compact with depth. And both the depositional trends and, and the diagenetic trends will affect the seismic properties. And using rock physics we can actually model how these changes occur. We can take this into account during exploration to better, before we drill the wells, try to say something about what is the expected seismic signatures for different pore fluids. And of course also it's important to say something about what happens if you go from one basin to another. So how can rock physics models be used to do this? Well, the rock physics models can be used both to say something about the fluid sensitivity, but also say something about how the seismic properties change as a fun function of geological texture. This figure shows some of my favorite rock physics models. On the vertical axis is a geophysical parameter. It could be seismic velocity or elastic stiffness. And on the horizontal axis is the reservoir porosity. And this model is for sandstone. But the sandstone can be loose, friable, and will have a completely different set of parameters than if it's cemented. So even for the same porosity, we could easily have two very different elastic stiffnesses. But that's of, of course a function of the geology. You can have some depositional trends, whether it's deposited in a beach setting or in a deep water setting. The porosities will be different as a function of, let's say, sorting or clay content. Also, as you bury the rock, your rock normally becomes stiffer as a function of burial depth. And that will have a completely different signature in this uh, cross-plot of elastic stiffness versus, let's say, porosity. So we're going to utilize these models to, in two case examples to show how we can link the rock physics to geological textures to better improve our reservoir prediction from the seismic observations. So we're going to go from the geophysical observables back to the reservoir geology using these rock physics models. So let's start with an example from the Alvheim field in the North Sea. And these, uh, this example has been uh, published in, uh, in uh, some papers. One paper by Avset, Drag and Van Windgarden and Jørsta in 2008 in the Leading Edge. And also some, ex some figures from a uh, paper by Charten Remsta et al. in 2012. This figure shows uh, some compactional trends of sands and shales. When we look at seismic data, it's very important to know the contrast between sand and shale. So the blue line to the left is a typical porosity depth trend for a pure shale. And it's combined or juxtaposed onto the porosity depth trend of clean sand. We see that both the shale and the sand reduces porosity, but at different pace with depth. So there will be some crossovers. And it's very important to understand how these porosity, uh, porosities of different rock types changes, because that will again affect the seismic properties. So most of the reservoirs that we look at are down at depths of several kilometers, and the Alfheim example is around two kilometers depth. It turns out that this is the same burial depth where we expect a change from mechanical compaction domain to chemical compaction domain. The temperatures are around 70 degrees at this depth, and that's exactly where we start to get quartz cementation happening in the sandstones. This means that some of the reservoirs at this depth can be completely loose if the cementation haven't started yet, 
or you can have some reservoirs that are slightly cemented, and in terms of the elastic properties, that can have a dramatic effect on the seismic properties. So you can all, if you think again about this balloon and the bottle, it's imp very important to know, do we have a balloon that is easy to compress and feel what's inside it? Or do we have a stiff bottle that is very hard to say what's inside? And it's, it's very important to, to determine how are the properties of these sands before we try to predict the fluids. This figure shows a seismic line intersecting uh, some of the turbidite lobes of the Alfheim field. We're looking into two wells here. There are well 1 and well 2. They're penetrating two different lobes, almost at the same burial depth. Interestingly enough, you can see there is an oblique reflector in the uh, shallower part of the section. Turns out that the western part has been uh, slightly tilted up. So this implies that the lobe penetrated by well 1 has been slightly deeper at some point, and slightly deeper than the lobe at well 2. If you remember the previous figure, we know that the onset of cement is happening at around this burial depth. So the question is now, are these lobes loose, like the blue, or are they cemented, like the bottle? It turns out that one lobe is more like the bottle and one is more like the balloon. So, in this study, what we did, we actually took into account these burial depth trends and included the, the uh, porosity depth trends and converted these to rock physics properties and used this to constrain a seismic inversion for this target area. Let's take a look at some of these uh, uh, well log data from a rock physics point of view. This figure shows to the left a cross plot of shear wave velocity versus porosity. The data plotted into this cross plot are from the target zone penetrating this lobe. So this is for well 1 which was the leftmost well in the previous figure. On top of this we have included some of our rock physics models, where we have quantified how the shear wave velocity changed as a function of cement volume. It's uh, a friable sand model, where the data points that plot near that line are friable. The data points that plot above this one will be, according to the model, cemented. We see that we have several of these constant cement lines, and that helps us to actually quantify, we can use rock physics models to actually quantify the cement volume. So the color of the data points are the quantified cement volume. And you see it varies from 0 to about 10%. The green data points are the shales, and they're just for the purpose of the numerics, given the value minus 1. It doesn't mean anything, it just means they're excluded from, from the sands. Uh, the thin section to the lower right shows that there are actually some of these quartz cement growing around the grain contacts. And these are gluing the grains together and it will have a drastic stiffening effect. And that's exactly what, what we see in this field, that the cement is stiffening in the rock and it's drastically reducing the fluid sensitivity. We can actually plot this quantified cement volume into, back into the log space and show how it plots as a function of, of burial depth. And what you see here is, to the left, is shale volume versus depth. The top of the reservoir is now around 2,100 meters. And you see from around that burial depth, you have an increase in cement volume from close to zero and increasing with depth up to 10% within a few hundred meters. And that actually fits with some of the published literature on this topic, that at around 2 km depth, quartz cementation start, and it increases with burial depth. This is uh, a slide showing the well of data, including porosity to the left, PV velocity, shear wave velocity that is measured, and density log, within the target zone from this well 1. And we have superimposed the rock physics depth trends. So we converted this porosity depth trends into rock physics depth trends, taking into account the fact that you have a change from loose sand to cementation. 
So you see there is a jump in the velocities occurring uh, at around 1900 meters. So the very first percent of cement has a drastic effect and then the effect is uh, tampering off with depth. Uh, the upper portion of this uh, reservoir is filled with gas and there is some brine in the sands as well as we see to, to the right. This is a cross plot of VP over VS on the vertical axis and acoustic impedance or VP multiplied by density on the horizontal axis. And this shows, and this is for the target zone, and it shows the probability density functions, which is the distribution of the different lithologies and fluids within this well. And you can see here that the shales are plotting with different VP VS ratios than the sands, but there is also uh, fluid signatures of gas and oil showing that these will have different VPVS and acoustic impedances than the brine filled sands. However, you see that there is a trend going from right, left to right where the brine sands and oil and gas sands are getting more and more overlapping as impedance increases and VPVS decreases. And this is again related to the fact that as you stiffen the rock with that and increasing cement, the fluid sensitivities are decreasing. So it's becoming harder to discriminate the oil and gas from the brine sands, and also to discriminate oil from gas. But having uh, quantified how this is controlled by the geological trends, it helps us at least to say something about the probabilities and uh, the most likely uh, fluid for any given observed set of VPVS versus consistent impedance. And this figure shows the results of, of classifying the inverted data. So these are data from the seismic we have used and compared with our PDFs that were extracted from the rock physics observations of well of data. Now we can group this into the right classes. To the left is the classified lithology and fluids where we accounted for these depth trends. And you can see now that we predict in red gas in well 1 and we predict oil in the lobe of well 2. And that's exactly what was observed in these two wells. If we didn't include these depth trends and just looked at uh, the seismic without constraining by the burial depth trends, we would actually end up predicting gas in both wells. So by linking it to the burial trends and these important onset of quartz cement, it actually helped us in this case to discriminate between oil and gas. The next example is from the Troll East in the North Sea. This was a paper published in uh, Geophysical Prospecting this year, in March number. Now we're actually going to look at 40 data and time shifts. And to the left is just a, a seismic figure showing the different layers uh, in the target zone. We have a gas column in the Songnifjör and Fensfjör formations. And then we have an overburden that has varying thickness across the field. To the right is a time shift observation. So we have some large time shifts during production. So it's a difference in travel time between the monitor and base survey between two different uh, years. And you see there are quite large time shifts occurring during production, especially at the crest to the left where the gas column is thickest. And that makes sense. You produce gas, the time shifts due to the velocity changes during production will be largest where the gas column originally was thickest. However, what we see here in this case, which I will demonstrate to you, is that it's also important to take into account the rock stiffnesses here, which will vary within the field. It turns out that because of the different thickness of the overburden, the reservoir rock in the eastern part of this field is more compacted and stiffer than the reservoir rocks along the crest to the left. And I'm going to demonstrate to you that the changes in time shifts is not only related to the thickness of the gas column, it's also related to the stiffness changes from west to east as a function of the burial history. This is a cartoon showing this more schematically. 
and it shows how this rotated fault block, which contains uh, the gas reservoir, and there's a gas water column there cutting through the fence fluid and solid formations. And I've also included two wells, well A and well B, penetrating this at two different locations. To the left, the well A is at the crest where you have large time shifts, and also where you have a thick gas water gas column down to the gas water uh, contact. And well B where you have a very thin gas column. And also indicated here that you have some compactional and depositional trend uh, in this uh, area that we're going to try to account for, especially the compactional trend. If you plot these two wells again into a uh, rock physics space where you can uh, investigate the rock stiffnesses as a function of the porosity and look at how this fits with models, we see that in well A, a lot of the data points are spread out in porosity, which is probably related to sorting, the positional variability. But you also see that uh, well B has quite overlapping porosities with well A in the reservoir, but they have much higher stiffnesses. And if we just include two of our models, the friable sand model or the loose sand model, together with the contact cement model, which is more the diagenetic trend, you see that the well B data are plotting closer to the contact cement model. And you see the, the, the change in shear modulus that is happening from well A to well B, uh, according to this rock physical model, should be uh, a function of the diagenesis and the cementation happening. So we have a stiffer rock in well B than in well A. We have created some rock physics models that quantify the stress sensitivities in this field as a function of cement volume. This was published by uh, me and together with Nuri and Shai in 2011 in Leading Edge. Not going in the, into the details, just saying that if sandstone data points are plotting close to a uh, friable sand trend, you will have the stress sensitivity according to Hertz, uh, Hertz uh, Mindlin contact theory. That's a lower plane or lower bound shown in the figure to the left. If all the grains are cemented, you will fall on a contact cement uh, trend, and there will be no stress sensitivity. The cross plot to the left includes porosity on one axis, the dry incompressibility on the vertical axis, and effective stress along the third axis. And as you see, the upper black lines represent no stress sensitivity, it's completely flat as a function of effective stress, and that's when we assume all the grains are cemented. But then if we plot in between the lower bound, which is the loose sand Hertzian uh, model and the upper bound, you will have a stress sensitivity as a function of, as a weighted function between these two. So it will be a linear function. That's our assumption. So we can create these stress probabilities for any given well well logged sample point, uh, depending on where it plots in between these two bounds. And that's just one example to the right there: the stress probabilities for the target zone in uh, the well A that I just showed you. So you see that there are, is quite some stress sensitivities and the velocities will change whether you deplete or inject. In this case we actually were depleting the reservoir so we'll increase the velocity slightly with depletion. And that will also affect the time shifts. So now we have a model that quantifies the velocity changes which again helps us to quantify the time shifts from a rock physics point of view. And then we can compare that with our observed time shifts. So this figure shows the results for both well and well B, but also some other wells in the area that we looked at. So we quantified how much seismic time shifts we would have between two surveys at this well location for uh, the target zone at the base of the reservoir. And if you compare these with the seismic observations, you see that the lighter colors that correspond to larger time shifts are uh, nicely corresponding with what we see in the seismic observations. So this actually proves to us that, that the seismic time shifts on the crest are larger, partly because of the, the thicker gas column on the crest, but also because of the different rock stiffness. We have a looser rock on the crest than down flank, so if you don't take into account the rock stiffnesses, we could easily predict the wrong pressure changes during depletion. Uh, so to conclude, 
with these two examples, I've hopefully convinced you that we really need to have a better integration with geology so we can constrain the non-uniqueness in quantitative interpretation. Especially be aware of the rock type and associated rock stiffnesses before looking, at, looking for hydrocarbons in seismic data. And I think both the examples from Alfheim and the troll data showed how important it is to understand the container when we predict what is happening, whether it's fluid changes or stress changes. And if rocks are well cemented, it can be hard to detect oil from seismic. Uh, and a special note on that is the fact that the oil window seems to normally be located around the burial depth where reservoir sand starts to become cemented. At the end of the day, remember that seismic is a sound of geology. And let's rock together. This is a cartoon showing a geologist conceptually to the left in a bar together with a geophysicist. And how about you keep, uh, keep us at arm length? Okay, finally, I would like to thank my employers, Norwegian uh, University of Technology and Science, and Telewoy, Norway. Thanks to Ivan Lehoski at Geospace for his essential contributions, and uh, there is also a long list of uh, collabor collaborators uh, behind these uh, presentations. So, with that, thank you very much. Goodbye.